Well, hello again, everyone. It's nice to see you all. As you can see, I am in the hallway today uh, because hallways in the, in the ship uh, connect one place to another place. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. We're at the place where we're out of the revolution and we're moving to a new place, uh, which is a constitutional republic. And so I thought it would be appropriate uh, to be in the hallway. Hopefully uh, there won't be too many people that come by while we're talking, um, but if they do, they do. Uh, so let's dig in. And you remember that when we last left, uh, the revolution had ended and the United States was, the new United States was faced with how to deal with, uh, with this land that they had uh, you know, that Great Britain seemed to be so generous about. And we talked about the reasons for that last time. So we'll talk about some of the laws that, that uh, make, make that happen. Um, but I want to first begin by talking about the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation is kind of like the hallway. It connects uh, kind of a loose confederation uh, to a strong constitution. Uh, or something called the Association in 1774 uh, with the Constitution uh, that goes into effect in 1789. And so uh, that's kind of where we're, where we're headed. So let's, let's take a look at the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation is a confederal form of government, meaning that the, the various entities within that government are stronger than the central government. In this case, it was the states, and the states had more power than the, than the central government. Uh, the central government was, as people said at the time, just a firm league of friendship uh, between the states. Uh, there, were so, there were several problems with the articles, not least of which is that they did not have the power to tax. They could ask for taxation, but they had no power to enforce that tax, so uh, they sort of, ha they had the power officially to raise an army, but they didn't have the power to pay them. So in effect, there was no, uh, no real army at this, at this point. Um, there, was, there was no, uh, what we think of as the judicial branch. So there was no court uh, that could adjudicate between states when, when state um, conflicts arose. There was no, uh, sense of a national currency, uh, like Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution talks about. Uh, so every state had their own currency, much like uh, European countries before the European Union, before the Euro, uh, where you would, you would walk 10 feet and you'd have to use a different currency and that sort of thing, and, different, and there were different exchange rates and that sort of thing. So, so the country was really functioning not as a United States, but really as a confederation of states uh, that all had their own sovereignty. Uh, and in fact, uh, there was so much sovereignty within these states that Virginia actually made its own peace with England after the revolution, uh, so which create, created all sorts of problems. So, uh, you can see that there, there are problems after problems after problems with the articles. But when we think about it, think of, think of the context in which it was created. It was created out of war, in wartime, after a declaration of independence, uh, because the king was seen as, as being uh, a tyrant, right? So, so it is not a surprise that the pendulum swung a little to the to the point of giving states more power. And so that's, that's kind of what happened there. Uh, I think of the Confederation, as do most historians, as a bridge, right? It's a bridge between really no real government um, or a very, very, very loose, more loosely configured than even a Confederation and a strong constitution. So that was, um, that were the, those were some of the positives. Now, other positives, uh, there was a call for a, a national um, post office, right, and post roads, uh, and that 
made the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8 again, calls for a post office and maintenance of post roads. Uh, and then there were two laws that were passed uh, during this time that really had to do with that land that I started by talking about. It was the Land Ordinance of 1785 and the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. And the, the Land Ordinance of 1785 talked about how a town would be laid out. Uh, and it was on this New England town model uh, that we talked about earlier. Uh, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 will establish the structure of states becoming states, where there is a territorial uh, section first when they have 10,000 residents, and then when they get 60,000 residents, then they can apply for statehood and get full representation in Congress and that sort of thing. Um, so that's those laws. Uh, will be some of the few laws that will make it into the Constitution from the confederal era era uh, and so that's those are pretty pretty important and and uh, that's in the land laws are in article four of the Constitution today all right um, so there are a couple of big things that happen in this period between 1783 and 1789 um, first of all internationally uh, the United States is not respected, right? It's the new kid on the block and it's bullied. Uh, pirates uh, are, see it as open season, especially uh, in the Mediterranean uh, because they are no longer flying the flag of, uh, the, of England uh, that could protect them. And so they, were, they are seen as vulnerable and pirates take advantage of that. In fact, uh, Jefferson will need to uh, deal with that later. Uh, with the, the Barbary pirates in 1802 so and through 1806 and we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later on. Um, the big thing that really kind of swings uh, things toward a stronger constitution happens in 1786-87 and this is called Shays Rebellion. Now Daniel Shays was a uh, a veteran of the revolution. He's living in Massachusetts. He's a Massachusetts farmer in the back country. And really, we can look at this, uh, this conflict as through the lens of kind of the rich versus the poor. And what happens after the revolution is that states are really trying to raise revenue, but the economy has kind of tanked. And so what happens is that farmers are kind of pressed in on this. And what happens is when they can't pay their taxes to Ma the Massachusetts government, then they are pulled into court and they are put um, in debtor's prison until they can pay their debts. Now, the irony with that, that you probably get already, is that if you're in, in prison, you can't pay off that debt. You can't work to pay off the debt. Uh, which was the reason you were put there. So there, so you're really in a no-win situation and then your farm is, is sold off and you lose everything. And so this really upsets Daniel Shays. Uh, Daniel Shays uh, became a captain. He, he uh, went up through the ranks during the revolution, became a captain, and he was even given a sword by the Marquis de Lafayette, right? But he falls on hard times and even has to sell that sword. Uh, to make money and make ends meet. Uh, so what happens is that he will um, lead this uh, discontented group of, of Western farmers. Uh, and the first thing that they do is they try to shut down the courts, these courts that would put them in debtor's prison. And they are successful in this. This, uh, of course, uh, just infuriates the people, the rich folks in Boston. Uh, and the state legislatures, legislators in Boston. Uh, ironically, one of those state legislators uh, is uh, Samuel Adams, who, uh, you know, just a few years before did the same things uh, that that Shays is doing, um, but to the British. But now he's on the other side of the fence, uh, which is kind of ironic as well. And so long story short, what happens is Shays has this idea that he's going to take uh, the armory and, and arm all these uh, 
these farmers and then go uh, storm Boston. Unfortunately for him, uh, there, it, his plan is found out. Um, one of the, one of the uh, runners that has the plans is captured and blah, 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 it all falls apart. And Shay's rebellion is put down um, in early 1787. The concern among the rich folks is this, that the federal government could not help them with this. They could not uh, bring in an army to quell this violence or this threat of violence. And so, um, and so that really is one of the impetuses for a newer and, uh, and stronger constitution. Uh, this is on the mind of people at uh, the Annapolis Convention in 1786, uh, which was associated with the Articles of Confederation. Um, but to show the weaknesses of the Articles, uh, there aren't even enough states that even send delegates for them to vote on anything. Uh, and even if they did, they would need to pass any law. They needed two thirds of the states to say yes. And to amend that document, they needed uh, a full quorum or a uh, 100% of everybody saying yes. And that the only time that it ever happened was to, in declaring independence. So, so the chances of that happening are just about zero. Okay, so enter. James Madison uh, and Alex Hamilton uh, and others that are at Annapolis and they have this plan. They say, well, would it be all right if we got together next year in Philadelphia and put together a proposal to change the Articles of Confederation? We can't do anything else. And Shays was on their mind as they're thinking about this. And of course, the, they said, oh yeah, yeah, you know, it's just a committee meeting. Sure, go for it. And so, but that's not what, what, the, what um, Hamilton and Madison and others had in mind. And so in May of, of 1787, they get together in Philadelphia. And what happens is that uh, they get there, they shutter the windows, they close the doors. And one of the first things they say is we are here to rewrite the, a constitution for the United States. And, and that's, at that time, not legal, right? They didn't have permission to do that under the auspices of the Articles of Confederation. Um, and so that was that. Was that. And, and so between May uh, 25th and September 17th, um, they craft this, this constitution. Now, it would have probably taken longer uh, but Madison, uh, who was anxious to get going, uh, had already pinned what he thought was the, um, the be-all, end-all, and about two-thirds of that is the Constitution. Um, he will pin that at, at Montpo Mont Montpelier, uh, his home in Virginia, um, overlooking the Allegheny Mountains. Um, so, uh, so that's that's that, and, um, and there are some, some big disagreements that need to be ironed out in that Constitutional Convention in 1787. The two big ones are, first, what is called the Great Compromise. The Great Compromise uh, is a bicameral legislature or two-chambered legislature where you have the House of Representatives and the Senate because what was happening is that the big states said, well, of course, we want power and we'll have more power because we have more people. The small states said, wait a minute, no, uh, states are states and we should have an equal voice. And so uh, the Virginia plan, which is Madison's plan, said it's based on population. The New Jersey plan said, no, it should be equal representation. And so what they did was they ironed out a compromise where the House of Representatives would be based, uh, based on and voted in by the people, and that's based on population. So that was the nod to the big states. And then there was the nod to the little states where you have senators, two from each state, that will represent that state as a whole. 
Uh, and so originally, before the 17th Amendment and the uh, direct election of senators and that sort of thing, there was a clear delineation that the House of Representatives represented the people of a state and the Senate represented the states um, because the state, the Senate was voted on and voted into office by the state legislatures, um, not by the people directly until the 17th Amendment in the early 20th century. So that, that's what's going on there. Um, the other big um, compromise had to do with how slaves would be counted for representation. Not that slaves would be represented, right? Because there is a caste system in the United States um, based on slavery, uh, but how they would, how their numbers would go into representation. Now the Southern states, the slaveholding states, wanted, uh, wanted all of the slave population numbers to be dumped in for representation because that would give the South more representation in Congress. The non-slaveholding states said, no, you can't have it both ways. You can't say that these slaves are chattel or movable property uh, on one hand and then count them for representation on the other. So there was a big hubbub about, around this. And eventually what happened is they came up with what was called the three-fifths compromise, where they would take three-fifths of the number, the whole number of slaves, and dump that into the number of the rest of the population for representation. So it gave the South more representation in Congress, but not as much as, uh, as it would have. Now, where did this three-fifths number come from, or this three-fifths three -fifths fraction come from? It was, uh, it had already been used in the Articles of Confederation for tax purposes, and so uh, it was not as, as extraordinary in that way uh, as, as we might think. And in fact, I would argue that it shows uh, that there was uh, this systemic racism and caste system in the fabric of the United States, even before the Constitution, uh, even dating back before the United States. Um, and so that's, that's a, a good example of that. And so that's the uh, that's kind of how we come out of the the constitutional convention. And then there was once this happens, there is this big hubbub, right? Because this was a super secret meeting, and all of a sudden they come out, they have this uh, this document, and then it has to be ratified by two thirds of the states according to Article 7 of the Constitution itself, uh, which is kind of a sneaky thing because Hamilton and, and Madison in particular uh, knew that to get all the states on board would be virtually impossible, right? They, they understood that you can't get everybody on board, so they said when two-thirds get on board, then we're going for it. And so then there was this huge debate uh, between the Federalists who wanted this Constitution and the Anti-Federalists that had great reservations about it. Um, and there was, a, there was a great deal of writing back and forth uh, about how this, how this would work and how this wouldn't work uh, between the Federalists and Anti-Federalists. Probably two of the most famous of those are Federalist 10, that argues that a republic over a large area, um, a representative republic, is the best safeguard of a republic um, that there is. And then Federalist 51 uh, talks about the checks and balances system uh, that we have in the structure of the three branches of government. And so those are two that are very, uh, very famous uh, as, as we go. Uh, what it will happen is that one by one by one through late 1787 uh, into 1788, uh, more and more states vote yes. And uh, when New Hampshire votes yes, that is the, uh, that reaches the two-third mark and the Constitution is scheduled to go into effect and elections are scheduled. Federal elections, the first federal elections are scheduled in 1788. Uh, there are four states, too small, too big, uh, that will 
lag behind in all of this, concerned about various things, right? Um, and about not having enough power generally. Uh, and these are uh, New York, Virginia, North Carolina, and uh, Rhode Island. And three of those four states hop on um, after they saw that they would be probably left behind if they didn't, didn't do this, uh, Rhode Island will be the holdout and not really ratify the Constitution until uh, the Bill of Rights is ratified in 1791. And so, but Rhode Island, um, no disrespect to Rhode Island, but it's the size of a postage stamp and so nobody cared. Um, so that's the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, and that will establish the republic under a constitutional uh, system, uh, federal system, where the federal government has more power than the states, uh, as opposed to a confederal system, which is the opposite. Uh, so the power is, is still shared, um, but the federal government has more power than this than the individual states. Now, one other thing before we end today, uh, the anti-federalists had some deep reservations about too much power and giving up too much power. And so there was a promise made that there would be some protections for individual liberties from the federal government uh, that would be part of uh, the first Congress, and in fact, that happens um, with the uh, with the first ten amendments to the Constitution, called the Bill of Rights. There were actually twelve at the at the outset. Uh, we'll talk about that next time. Uh, the ones that were left out, uh, one of them eventually will be put back in in the 1990s. The other one, uh, personally, I'm glad that it didn't. Um, uh, come to fruition. And we'll talk about that later. Uh, but that's the story of going from the Articles of Confederation to uh, our constitutional republic under a system of federalism. And uh, we'll see how that goes when we come back. Um, but uh, remember the hallway. That's the Articles of Confederation. Have a good day, everybody.